Hey guys, Matt here from the Armourer's Bench. Today we're going to do something I never thought I'd get the chance to do. I'm going to show you how to field strip an HK G11. Okay, let's dive straight into the space magic and see how it works. First, we remove the G11's cleaning brush that's held in a compartment in the pistol grip. A little fiddly with just fingernails, but it's doable. The brush is used to check that the chamber is empty. The brush is inserted into the circular ejection port seen a few inches behind the pistol grip. This checks that the chamber is empty and that the weapon is clear. And when you finish with the brush, you can insert it back into the pistol grip and carry on with disassembly. Next we'll remove the G11's 50 round single stack magazine. As you can see I've already freed up the fore end as the plastic locking tabs are quite stiff. Inside the fore end is a metal tube that the barrel projects through. The barrel assembly is essentially free floated. Here's a photo of the inside of the fore end showing the barrel tube. You don't have to remove the fore end to field strip the weapon, but I thought it was worth removing so we could take a look at the barrel. Now we need to remove the butt assembly. To do this, we depress the two locking tabs at the same time and pull it to the rear. As you can see, it's a bit of a three-handed job here. You have to ensure that the action is cocked to allow the rear assembly to slide off. And now we have the rear of the breech and barrel assembly exposed. The next step is to free the control disc. To do this, we lift the catch spring and move it clockwise until it clicks. Now we must depress the clamping spring to free the disc from its post. With the spring depressed, the control disc can be lifted up from the top of the cylinder. We'll set the control disc to one side for now and we'll take a look at it in a moment. We can now push the catch spring clockwise again to its next stop point so that it's no longer covering the cylinder. Next we have to press the cylinder stop lever counterclockwise. Then pushing up from the other side of the action we can lift the cylinder out of the breech assembly. Sorry my hand gets in the way here but it was a little bit tricky getting the cylinder out of the action. Here we can see the square chamber inside the breech cylinder. This piece is held in place by a retainer spring. Now that the cylinder is removed, let's take a closer look at the breech assembly. We can see the compression spring which attaches to the clamping plate, the space for the breech cylinder and the beginning of the barrel, the spring catch and the ejector lever, the striker assembly and the control lever and beneath the action we can see the sear and the stop lever we're now beginning to get an idea of just how complex the G11's action actually is the 1989 HK ACR manual lists over 440 parts making up the rifle, with over 140 of those going into the actual action itself. Ok, now let's take a close up look at the control disc. That outer groove interfaces with a tab on a pivoting latch, which interacts with the stop lever. Using my trusty Swiss pointing device, we can see where the central post interfaces with the disc and how the clamping spring clips into the notch on the post. Here we can see where the square breech lines up with the round bore. 
and from this angle we get our first view of some of the G11's gears. Let's look at the breech cylinder. This can be disassembled further by removing the spring retainer which holds the chamber in the cylinder. But while disassembling I didn't want to take the risk of losing the spring. The chamber was actually a replaceable part. HK Literature from 1988 notes that the chamber had an approximate service life of around 3,500 rounds but it was hoped that a planned redesign would extend this towards 6,000 rounds. With the weapon flipped, we can see the other side of the action. We can see the actuating lever projecting from underneath the spare gear, and from beneath that we can just see the disconnector. And here we can see the magazine catch and guide housing. Here we can see how the G11's pair of gears move. During the firing cycle, the connecting rod, attached to the actuating gear here on the right, moves the gear, acting on the spare gear on the left. This in turn actuates the feeding lever, which we can see here moving up and down. Here at the back, attached to the clamping plate, we have the striker assembly and spring. From this angle we can see into the rifle's centre assembly. We can see the magazine guide and the robust guide rail where the barrel and breech assembly is held in the G11's centre assembly. And at the base of the action we can see the sear. And here's a side view of the G11's gears moving. Inside the centre assembly, just below the barrel, we can see the rear of the G11's recoil mitigation buffer system. From this angle we get an idea of just how intricate and complex the G11's action really is. We can see a number of springs, and numerous high tolerance moving parts. Here with the weapon on safe we can pull the trigger to show how the actuating lever acts on the clamping plate and compression spring which in turn acts on the firing pin. These diagrams from the G11's manual go some way towards showing how complex the action actually is. The magazine, when loaded, travels back through the centre assembly into the action. Here we can see the magazine catch, which is acted on by the external magazine release button. Here, with the magazine inserted, we can see how the catch works. Note the white outline of a caseless round to show which way up the magazine should be inserted. Once the breech cylinder is removed, the operator's manual provided to the US Army in March 1989 actively discourages further disassembly. I could only go a little further before special tools that sadly I didn't have were needed. To release the breech and barrel assembly from the central assembly, a small catch has to be released to allow the breech assembly to come free allowing it to slide out of the rear. Here's the G11 disassembled into its major assemblies. We've got the magazine, fore end, centre assembly, barrel and breech assembly, and buttstock. During a field strip of the G11, it's not necessary to remove the barrel and breech assembly from the fore end and centre assembly. But I decided to do it so that we could have a look inside at both the gas cylinder and the buffer assembly.
Here we can see the housing containing the counter recoil mechanism, which mitigates the weapon's recoil. We can also see the pointed tip of the buffer extension. This overlay diagram from the 1989 Armourer's Manual shows the internals of the recoil system. Under the barrel we can see the sear arm, operating rod, and the various catches, springs and clips, which hold the assembly together. On the right side of the gun we can see where the operating rod connects to the gas piston system, and at the other end of the rod we can see where it attaches to the actuating gear. Here we can see the underside of the barrel and breech assembly, including the counter recoil buffer system and the gas system. As we move along the underside of the weapon, we can see the gas piston at the top and the recoil mitigation system below. And here's another look at the underside of the action. This view of the top of the barrel and breech assembly shows the position of the recoil system on the left and the gas piston system on the right. We can also see the markings on the top of the barrel, which can just be seen through the guide rail. Let's take a look inside the central assembly, which houses the trigger mechanism and the guide rail interface. Above the guide rail we can see the sealed track that the magazine runs in. Here we can see the hole in the centre assembly that the barrel projects through. And in the magazine compartment we can see the hinged door that stops Dare from entering the action. Ok, before we reassemble the rifle let's take a look at how it worked in principle. G11 has three modes of fire, single shot, three round hyperburst at approximately 2000 rounds per minute, that's about 33 rounds per second, and full auto at 450 rounds per minute. It's a gas operated rotating breech system with a spring buffer system to control recoil. Rotating the weapon's cocking handle drops the first round into the breech cylinder vertically. It then rotates 90 degrees with the breech cylinder lining up with the bore. When the trigger is pulled, the striker assembly ignites the round and fires the weapon. As the rounds are caseless, there is no extraction of the spent cases. An ejector is present for clearing the weapon only. Once a round is fired, propellant gas is tapped from the barrel, and a piston system connected to the breech cylinder rotates the cylinder and actuates the loading mechanism before rotating the cylinder back into battery and allowing the cycle to begin over again. When a round is fired, the barrel and breech assembly recoil along the guide rail in the centre assembly. This compresses the recoil spring into the buffer. In single shot, the barrel and breech assembly moves about 50mm or 2 inches towards the rear. In burst mode, it moves 110mm or 4.3 inches but only once the last round of three has left the barrel. This limits recoil until the last round has been fired and ensures a smaller round dispersion downrange. Okay, let's reassemble the G11. First we insert the barrel and breech assembly back into the center assembly, lining up the guide rails until it locks into place. As you can see, this was a little tricky lining up the barrel with the hole at the front of the center assembly. But eventually, the barrel and breech assembly seat home with an audible click. Then we place the breech cylinder back into the action 
align the cylinder and let the cylinder stop lever go home. And then we slide the catch spring counterclockwise until it clicks into place. We then replace the control disc, this is one of the most fiddly steps, and allow the catch spring to seat. Then we replace the buttstock assembly. And finally we replace the forend and slide the magazine back into the weapon. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this look inside the mysterious and legendary G11. Special thanks go to the collection that hold the G11 for allowing me to strip it. Definitely one of the more nerve wracking experiences I've had, but a real pleasure to get a look inside the mythical beast first hand. And I hope from this video you can get an idea of just how complex and ambitious the G11 was. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend you check out Vic's great introductory video on the G11 where he examines not one, but two G11s. Vic has also done an excellent series of videos looking at the other ACR Trials rifles, and they're well worth checking out as well. If you enjoyed the video guys, please share it around with friends who might be interested. Uh, I think it might actually be the very first G11 disassembly video online. Don't forget to also check out our website, armorersbench.com, for a full accompanying blog with many more photographs of the G11 and its component parts. If you enjoyed the video, please consider supporting us over on our new Patreon page. The link for that is in the description below. We regularly share behind the scenes content, including sneak peeks at upcoming videos. As always, thank you for watching and see you in the next one.